My name is Jim Brown. I'm your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. We always read to you some of our emails and some of our letters. We've got a lot of letters. We can't get to all of them. Uh, I, I just read emails and and some YouTube comments. The emails pretty much agree with me, and the YouTube comments are people who venture on to our YouTube site, and a lot of them want to give me thunder, <laughs> give me a hard time. doesn't affect my teaching. But we are on the Internet all over the world, needless to say, and I get... I get emails and comments from Australia and China and Japan and Germany and France and England and and uh, everywhere, all over the world, all over the United Kingdom, which is all over the British Commonwealth countries. And uh, I, get, I even got an email from Iran. That is the biggest enemy of America. Uh, and they are supported and backed by Russia. And I got an email from Iran, and the guy said, I can't, I can't uh, accept your DVDs. They won't allow me to have them here. I said, would they, if they knew you was in contact with us, would they kill you or something? He said, probably. So we've got him in contact with John Neroar in New York, and he gets on Skype with John, and uh, then we're on TV all over America, all up and down the East Coast and the West Coast. The West Coast, we're on in, in San Francisco, San Diego, San Jose, all of the sands. And we're on in Panorama City. That's where John MacArthur's got his seminary. And we're on up in San Francisco, Los Angeles, up in Oregon. And then across the Northwest, we're on in Montana, we're on in uh, Chicago. I can't remember all the places. All over Kansas, the Midwest. And we're on in uh, Michigan. Then we're on in all the boroughs of New York, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan, the Bronx. And then we're on down the eastern seaboard in uh, Boston, Philadelphia. I think we're on in Pittsburgh. And then we're on in Washington, D.C. and down in Charleston, South Carolina, and in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, Des Moines, Iowa. Gosh, we just went back on in Fort Worth, Texas, and one in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Beaumont, San Antonio, Austin, and uh, went on the two big cities in Oklahoma, Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And these are people that write to us. Uh, Michael Nietzsche is our representative for a station over in Charlotte, North Carolina. He says, Hi, Pastor Jim, Mary Grace and Truth in our Lord, and you please tell me the type of King James Bible I should be studying from. Well, uh, King James Bible is all the same as far as the text. I use a Thompson chain. You can get this. They're kind of expensive, uh, but it's got all kinds of help notes in it. Uh, a King James is a King James. I stay with the Thompson chain because that way I, when I mark them up, I know exactly where the verses are, what part of the, spa the page they're on. And then uh, this is uh, uh, from Michael Nietzsche in Charlotte, North Carolina. We love you, Michael. Keep writing. Lily in West Virginia. Pastor, so that seed that is the man is from God, not to sin against him in the man's spirit. Well, that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Why? Because his seed, the seed is the word of God, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. That's the inner man. The outer man can't quit sinning, but over the years, God will deal with the outer man with fire and trials and persecution. And I'm here as a living testimony to tell you that's what he did to me. He, you're birthed with the seed, which is the word of God, and then the outer man serves self. And when you first come to Christ, you have little faith. O-L-I-G-O-S. Oligos, pistis. Oligos means puny. Pistis is the word faith. 
You have little faith, but faith grows. Besides all this, give all diligence, add to your faith. And God names seven things we have to add, but it takes years to add that. Virtue is the first one on the list. That's the word arete, virtue, arete, and that means maturity. How long does it take you to mature in Christ? It takes 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It takes a long time to mature. And then it's got knowledge and temperance and all the way down to charity of God, and that's walking in God's commandments. And uh, But anyway, uh, this is Lillian, West Virginia. I spoke like God was speaking through me on Facebook account, but it was not God, it was me. How do I seek God for forgiveness? Real easy. <laughs> if God is rebuking you, then repent. Metanoia, M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. -A. It means to be turned by God and think differently. All you do is say, Lord, I repent, and that's in my heart, and forgiveness is there. Forgive, forgive, forgive is the word aphemi, A-P-H-E-I-M-I. -E it means to send away as though it had never happened. Now, whenever you forgive somebody, that's what you have to do. If a man sins against you 70 times, how many times do you forgive him? 70 times 7. Then, uh, we love you, Lily. We appreciate your words. Michael in Las Vegas writes, Pastor Jim, please do another video keeping the same title, The Defense of Alexander Hislop. A lot of people were against his book, Two Babylons. I've got one here, right here. Now, Mr. Hislop, this is a wonderful book. He's got 265 ancient authors in his bibliography. You're going to have to refute all those authors to refute him. He was a member of the Free Church of Scotland. That Scotland was the home of John Knox, the great reformer. And he was a part of that movement in that system. He lived a couple of hundred years ago. And uh, people want to refute this. The guy that tried to refute it, I can't think of his name. Uh, who was the guy, Mike? Woodrow. Woodrow. Yeah, Ralph Woodrow. Ralph Woodrow is an ignoramus when he tried to refute this book. He didn't even deal with these with these authors that he quoted. He just said a bunch of ridiculous, stupid things. I'll go back into that on another time. I'm not through with refuting that. What I did was went through Mr. Woodrow's book, uh, Babylon Mystery Connections or something like that, and I marked the book up, and it's some of the dumbest. Now, Mr. Woodrow looks very respectable. You can go online and see him, and he's in a three-piece suit and got a tie and a and a watch for him. He looks very respectable, but he's an ignoramus. <laughs> you can't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Don't believe Woodrow when he re tries to refute this book. It's Mr. Woodrow said, I first embraced that book, and then some high school teacher come to me and said, oh, that's not true. So I just started approaching it from that viewpoint. And, and whoever that high school teacher was was an idiot. You don't need to listen to them. And this is a fantastic book. When you read one page, it's got so much information, you're going, whew, and you can't even imagine this has got more information than any one book that I have ever read after, including these volumes of McClinic and Strong. Now, these have more simple explanations in here, but he gets into some unbelievable heavy-duty things. The best way to read this book or any difficult book is go back to the to the index in the back and look up various subjects and kind of thumb down and look through them and you'll find a subject that you're interested in looking at. He's the one that will tell you that the priests of Baal wor worshipped a flaming cross in the ancient world. And out of Mr. Hislop's book, The History of His, not Hislop, Mr. Edersheim's book, The History of Israel, when he gets to the 18th chapter 
of First Kings, he will say, those priests of Baal look quite ridiculous, quite ridiculous, in their long white robes and their white pointed hats. That shows you that the clan comes out of the same thing as Christmas. So if you're black and you celebrate Christmas, there's something wrong with you if you find this out. So anyway, I don't get all of my answers out of one book. I look at many, many books. And I've got about several thousand in my library at home. But anyway, he goes on to say, in defense of Hislop, all the evidence that defends Hislop, para scholars or parallel scholars still attack him, saying there is no biblical evidence connecting Nimrod with Osiris. That is ignorant. They try and disprove Shem slaying Nimrod. This is crazy. He's, all he's looked at is the two Babylons. He hasn't looked at McClintock and Strong. You can go into McClintock and Strong. It'll give you the birthday in the M volume under Mithra, the chief son god of Babylon. It'll tell you December the 25th was his birthday, and it was celebrated in Rome as a great orgy and party. And he hasn't looked at, has not looked at the Encyclopedia of Religion, which is a 13-volume set, you go into this, and you'll be studying on this the rest of your life, and you won't even get into part of it. These are magnificent books, just like the McClunick and Strong. Not only that, he, he didn't study, he didn't study Mythology of All Races. That's the 13-volume set I've got in my library. He didn't study the Golden Bough. The Golden Bow is 13 volumes about paganism in the ancient world. He didn't study hardly anything. He just looked at his book and said, I can't find these in the Bible. You're ignorant, Mr. Woodrow. But he goes on to say something called the Pyramid Text, along with Apocrypha and Josephus, doesn't back up Hislop's book. Well, you've got to go to more than that. One scholar called Baal the Thunder God. When you look up Hercules in the H volume of McClinic and Strong, it'll tell you that Hercules was the Tyrian Baal or the Baal of Tyre, which was right above Israel, which was brought down into Israel by Ahab when he married the prince of Tyre's daughter Jezebel. That's in the Bible. These guys that are looking to, to debunk some teaching by saying, you've got to come up with better, better illustrations than the one you're coming up with. And then he goes on to say, they think his got it all from Deodorus Siculus. That's not true. That's like saying Jim Brown got all his teachings from Deodorus Siculus. You're ridiculous when you believe that. That the Bible doesn't talk about Semiramis, so they don't believe his love. All it, can, all it has to do is talk about the mother of the gods or the queen of heaven. Queen of heaven is the Mary of Roman Catholicism. You can go into the Q volume, look up queen of heaven and, and McClinic and Strong. And they didn't get all their information from, from Mr. Hislop because the McClinic, the, the McClinic and Strong was researched between 1850 in 1885 and had hundreds of contributors and his book came out about 1853 I believe so they didn't get their information from his love you got to go into a lot more than one volume or two volumes to know these things all right they're confusing the sheep as much as preachers do you're exactly right Michael in Las Vegas. We love you, Michael. Keep on. I'll come back to that. I just gave you a few pointers on it as I'm going through this. I haven't read a few books. I've been reading since I was a kid. And when I got into the biblical history, I've read tons of information. Even in McClinic and Strong, you can't believe everything they say. 
there were hundreds of contributors. You've got to examine it, exegete it, and make sure that it ties with Scripture. But I had a guy used to come here and said, I found error in, in Edersheim's book, so I threw them all away. <laughs> you can't throw them away because you find error in them. One man, if they say I.E., that is to say, you've got to examine that. That may be true and it may not. Or that means, if they say that means, well, look at it. I exegete everything. I'm very analytical in everything I read. I, hear, I read things, I'm going, that can't be true because that's contradicting Scripture here. Michael in Las Vegas, we love you, Michael. Keep on writing. Stephen Mosef in Highland Park, California, writes, Hi, hello, Pastor Jim, Sister Mary, Brother Tom, Brother Mike, All Grace and Truth Ministry. Stephen Mosef in Highland Park, California. Agape, thank you, Pastor Jim, for leading the flock. I am following your advice and not associating with so-called brothers and sisters who insist on following a parallel doctrine. That's what Paul said, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you have learned. The word contrary is the word para. It's our word parallel. It's a parallel doctrine. Contrary doesn't mean at the opposite end of the universe from the truth. It means runs right along with a with the doctrine of Christ. They got a Jesus, they got a salvation, they got a saved. That's the other Jesus, the other spirit, the other gospel. Well, that's hard to recognize when you go to these churches. But the elect will hear it. I'm being crucified nearly every day by sharing God's doctrine. Well, you will be. Which I humbly thank you, Pastor Jim, for teaching. It is quite astonishing to people when I share that God does not love everybody. Well, you didn't make that up. I didn't make it up. God said that he loved Jacob and hated Esau. He hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. That's the thing I say to people immediately when I have this shirt on that says, God does not love everybody. Well, I think God loves everybody. I said he, said he hated Esau before he was born. What do you think of that? They'll go, look like I hit him in the face with a dead fish or something like that, or a dead squirrel. All right, quite astonishing to people when I share that God does not love everybody. And from the same lump of clay, he chooses vessels of wrath fitted to de destruction and vessels of mercy fitted to eternal life. And that's talking about th from the womb of Rebecca. When Rebecca had conceived by one, even by Father Isaac, he loved Jacob and hated Esau. So then cannot God make one vessel into honor and another to dishonor to, from the same clone, same lump of clay. Nobody likes daily cross. Deny self, self, death to self. As for me, this is how, this is now how I pass my soul journey here. Agape Stephen Mosif in Highland Park, California. Then Brett, we love you, Stephen. Keep on writing to us. Brett writes to us from South Dakota. Jim, this is Brett Trotter from Rapid City, South Dakota. I've been there. That's where the big Mount Rushmore is. I love you. You have opened my eyes for a couple of years now. This starts off sounding political, but I promise it isn't. I don't expect you to answer all the questions. It's just so you understand where I'm coming from. I'm coming to you asking, not telling. The Internet says Pfizer, Madonna, and Jay and Jerry Johnson Johnson all use fetal cells from abortion for testing the COVID vaccine. Johnson Johnson used them for development, testing, and manufacturing. Publicly, Jay and Jay use fetal cell line per C6. He was a boarded baby one year younger than me in the Netherlands. Maybe it's a lie. If what they say publicly is true, then process required harvesting flesh from murdered babies. It got me thinking about Revelation 18, 23 and 16, 13, unclean like frogs. Well, that's not because you partake in something that you didn't kill the baby. 
that's like, do you shop at a grocery store? Any grocery stores you shop at? Do they sell beer? Are you contributing to their being able to buy more beer and sell to your neighborhood? You can't, you can investigate everything and everything you're involved in. You, the car manufacturers, they're, some of them are involved in things that are completely unlawful. Does that mean you don't buy a car? No. Wherever your heart is, that's where it should be. For Jews have to pour the blood of a clean animal on the ground for it to remain clean after death. The Jews had to do a lot of things. They had to keep all their rituals that had been nailed to the cross with Christ. You can't keep the blood. I remember researching that the word frog, frog is an amphibian. It has two natures, land and water. That's like the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, isn't it? It is the only place you find it in the Bible. Being in Revelation, perhaps it was left for us in our day to interpret. What does a fetus, fetal lab experiment look like? That doesn't have anything to do with you. Do they keep the blood? That's like saying, well, what about the smallpox vaccine? I got that when I was a kid. What did they use for that? If they used something that was illegal or unlawful, but it kept me from getting smallpox and diphtheria, I don't know what they were made of. I don't know what the polio vaccine was made of. It's not my intention to kill a baby, but if they come up with something, it comes from that area. I'm not, you cannot investigate everything from everybody, everywhere, than anything that you buy or partake of. Can you? Nobody can. That's like saying if I happen to get a hold of something that took some crime to do it and it came to me and was for my good. What are these vaccines growing on? I don't really care. I took the vaccines. One guy called me and jumped down my throat because I took them because he thinks it has to do with Democrats or Republicans. Does that have anything to do with them? I don't believe in either one of them. I don't believe in Donald Trump, and I do not believe in Joe Biden. I think they're both corrupt. Well, they're popular, aren't they? To get the vote, don't you have to be popular? Both of them have been popular in these last eight years. Donald Trump got the big vote when he got to be president, and so did Joe Biden. So, friendship with the world is enmity against God. Are they friends with the world? Yeah. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. Well, the majority of people spoke well of both of them. Do I believe they're Christians? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Christians take their cross and die daily. Now, I can't help but think the sorcerers are a form of pseudical industry sees this as one of the many ways to capitalize on murdered babies. You know, we could talk about this for a month. All I'm saying, if you didn't murder the baby, it doesn't have nothing to do with you. The fruits of abortion in our current world, where do we think they get all the impossible to synthesize raw materials to do all this propriety human immunological, immunological research. It doesn't matter where they get it if they're curing people and keeping them from dying. These come, like I said, you go investigate this, investigate every program they've ever initiated. What about every flu virus every year? Is anything corrupt connected with it? Probably. These companies in the whole pharma industry are in a bed with Planned Parenthood. I don't believe in what's her name, head of Planned Parenthood. What's her name? That's the best I can do with her. I'm not for her. That ain't got nothing to do with anything. You're straining a gnat and swallowing a camel. Would they let 60 million babies go to waste? I'm not going to get on abortion. It was, a, it was against God's law in the 21st chapter of Leviticus if two men were wrestling and there was a pregnant woman nearby and they accidentally bumped into her and if there's any harm or there was any 
abortion happened accidentally. It was life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, foot for foot, burning for burning. You had to pay with your life if the lady accidentally aborted a baby. So what do you think about these laws that we have where they're intentionally? I don't believe in abortion. I had a girl come up to me one night years ago. She came to church. Her sister comes here now. And she came up to me, and her sister's a good Christian, loves the Lord. And she said, is, she said, I am a lesbian. Is it, home, is it against the law to be a lesbian? I said, sure it is. But I said, she said, it is a sin. I said, yeah, it's a sin. But I said, it's not any different any of the, than any of the other presumptuous sins. A presumptuous sin, the word is zed or zud, Z-U-W-D. It means planned. That's a Hebrew word. And David said, deliver me from presumptuous sins. Is If anybody knew about presumptuous sin, it was David. He intentionally committed adultery with Bathsheba when you saw her naked on the top of her house next door to the palace. said, get her, I want her. Then he got her pregnant. Was that a sin? Yeah. And then he had her husband Uriah the Hittite killed in battle. Told his nephew Joab, who was his commander, withdraw, put him in the heat of battle and withdraw. David did that. Could David be forgiven? Well, certainly he could. But God, but God had Nathan, the prophet, tell him, the sword will never leave your house, and it didn't. I'm not on a, an abortion kick or on a homosexuality kick. I told this girl it's not any different than killing. It's no different than adultery. When people ask me, do you believe in capital punishment? That means put somebody to death. And I'll say to them, for which capital sin? For murder? For adultery? For homosexuality? For slapping your parents in the Old Testament? There were many capital crimes in the Old Testament to die for. For gathering sticks on the Sabbath in Numbers, the 15th chapter. God said, kill that boy. I used to believe in capital punishment until I read this book about capital punishment in America. And 13% of the people on death row through DNA, through checking the DNA, were innocent. Boy, that 13% is too many to put the others to death. I believe in capital punishment in the church. <laughs> in the church, what have I to do with those who are outside the church, Paul said? I have nothing to do with them. Uh, you've kind of opened up a, a, not a can of worms, but some information here. Let me just read the rest of this. The mothers don't confirm that the baby was successfully dispatched and they've been caught red-handed selling baby parts. Well, what about car parts? How do you know the car you've got, some of the parts weren't put in one of these junk dealers that tear, how do you know it wasn't stolen? How do you know in the stealing that somebody wasn't killed in it intentionally? You cannot get to trying to check out everything. Your, your mind and your heart has to be right with God. That's all. You can't figure out if there was anything unlawful in everything in your life. Can you? Supporting one is funding the other. But in today's world, no biggie. If you fair feel it's okay. I'm not going to read the rest of this. He just goes on to say, am I way off? I believe we're all way off. It's our heart that is made right with God, not whether we did something or didn't do something. I did some things in my past I am ashamed of, and I'm not going to tell you what they are. Well, the Bible says we're not even discuss those things that were done in the darkness. We've been forgiven of those. Has anybody else been guilty besides me? I know you have. 
There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to me. All I have to do is own up and admit what's in my heart. And I know what everybody here is willed to do at some time or another. It seems in general the power of miracles and protection from the Lord resides in the faith of some inside you. Not actually thinking the brilliance of man must interfere to save us. Can a bad tree produce good fruit? No, it can't. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's talking about Satan. Could you run with this idea, however, and take it too far? Yeah, you can, because you, that means you're going to have to check out everything in your life that you do. Stop, stop shopping at a grocery store that sells beer or liquor because it may get somebody drunk, and you may be contributing to them distributing more liquor so somebody can come in and go out and get in a car and run into somebody and kill them. You can't look at things hypothetically and say, let's just say this happens. It's in your heart and in your mind. It's not in what somebody else did. What do you think? I'm not trying to defend anything. Is this forward application of the Scripture, particularly with the frogs being aborted fetuses? I don't believe the frogs are aborted fetuses. That same, that same verse in Revelation 16 said the frogs were like demons, and the word demon, devils, and the word is demonic on distributing fortunes. The frogs have to do with the preachers in the pulpit that preach another Jesus. They've got a Jesus, but it's the wrong one. They've got a gospel, but it's another gospel. And Paul said, this will lead you away. That's enough said. Brett in South Dakota, I hope I've answered some of your questions. If you start asking questions about shots, you've got to go and research all the other shots you've ever taken. And say, did I transgress against God? Not unless you transgressed in your heart. Then, I got some YouTube comments. Now, these people, most of them don't like me. LM commented on all holidays come out of Babylon. Easter is the resurrection of Tammuz. So far in my understanding, I believe in both free will and predestination. Looks like me and you are not going to get along. You can't believe in free will and predestination. It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Your will has nothing. Of his own will begat he us. That word will, bulema, B-O-U-L-E-M-A, means purpose. We were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That word will in John 1, 13 is thelema. And thelema means determination. You, don't, you aren't born again by your determination. All are given free will. No, they are not. Every seem like you start a sentence with something that's not true. All are given free will up to the point that God does action. How can you have a free will to come to him when the Bible says, no man can come to me except the Spirit draw him? Draw is the word helco. It means to drag in. You can't come to God, John 6, 44. Nobody can come. There is none, Romans 3, 10, 11, 12. There is none that seeketh after God. What that says, there's none that has the will to come to God. Nobody. He's got to put it in every man's heart that he is elected to believe him. And the will to come does not originate in you or me. Nobody can come. And then he says, that is when God intervenes. Intervenes? You mean intercedes? Intercede is the word pagal in the Hebrew. It's the word E-N-T-U-G-C-H-A-N-O in the Greek. Both of them have the same meaning. It means to impinge progress. It's like if you're driving down the road in a car 
and you're about to come to this road and you see a little kid about to walk out in the road and there's a car coming and what you do is you run over and hit that car and knock it out of the way. That's, inter that's interceding. But your will is not involved. It's God's will. I just don't know if I want to read the rest of this. No man can forcefully stop him. No man can stop any man from doing what God is doing. But it seems specific people are predestined. Well, it's not seems. Whom he did foreknow. Foreknow, prognosco, means to know intimately ahead of time. Prognosco, those are the only ones. It means to know intimately ahead of time, before. Those are the ones that are predestined, nobody else. He knew us in his mind before the foundation of the world. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame. Not even going to go to holy and without holy, hagios, without blame, I'm almost. Yeah. It seems that specific people are predestined to certain acts and duties. That's, we're predestined to be born and then God is going to conform us to Christ's likeness. If the apostle says we are predestined, it doesn't say we. It says whom he did foreknow. It may not mean he is referring to every person who will be saved. You are so ignorant, sir. You don't know nothing about the Bible. You don't have any business even writing to me. You need to go get you a strong, exhaustive concordance. Start looking up these words and quit giving me your opinion about what you think things mean. Although a person who is one of the chosen then or even up to our current day could easily believe that. What? This guy is very confused. And that makes sense because, no, it doesn't make sense to me. You don't make sense. Because they know that God has intervened in their life soul. God hasn't intervened. He's picked out his people who they'll be. Puts faith in their heart. Ranges their life to cross the preaching of truth. Or they pick up a Bible and read it. And then it cuts into the heart and they believe. But they don't believe by their will. They believe by the will of God. It's not of him that willeth. Not of him that runneth, but of God shows mercy there in Romans 9. It makes sense, but it is fully true. It's not true at all. You are so messed up, whoever you are. Many are called, but few are chosen. Thank you for quoting that verse out of Matthew, the 20th chapter. Few are eclectos. That's the word chosen. Elect. We elected unto obedience. The call goes out to the world, but only a few, oligos, well, only a few have faith and enter the narrow way. This guy is so messed up in his thinking. He appears to want to know something about the Bible and he knows enough to be messed up. Whew. Let me see. What does a predestined or chosen man accomplish if he brings to the Savior nothing to the harvest? You are so ignorant. I'm just calling him ignorant. What do you mean if he brings nothing to the harvest? Are you out of your mind? We've been predestined to be conformed. Sumarphos. S-U-M, that's one word in the Greek, S-U-M-M-O-R-P-H-O-S. Conform comes from morphe, which means to be shaped in fellowship with to the image of his son. Image, icon, means likeness. If we're like Christ, we're going to bring forth fruits called... Cause to be works of repentance. Oh, you're going to repent and bring forth fruits if you belong to him. There's no such thing as somebody say, well, he got saved when he was young, but he never did live right. I heard about a guy, he got killed on a motorcycle about 35 years old, and they say he went to his, they went to his funeral, 
And somebody said, well, you live like the devil and took drugs and drove and this motorcycle 100 miles an hour and got drunk all the time. But he got saved when he was eight. No, he didn't. Good grief. I can't believe people even think like that. Just so got saved as something some free will preacher said, walk down the aisle and accept Christ and you're home free. And that's not true. Gosh, boy, some people with their minds are twisted. Let me see here. Boy, it's, it's fun reading this and answering it. <laughs> Why would he call them to rely his word to other people if only the predestined can be saved? I'm not even going to answer that. You are so ignorant. People say you shouldn't insult people who call them ignorant. Ignorant means unlearned. That's what it means. You're not learned at all, LM. I could go much further than that. Gosh, I hope not. Martyrs who are killed for their testimony, the predestined, are the first fruits. I'm not going to go into that, but this is not the total harvest. The chosen plant or the chosen plant more seed, the called, the one of the call, but not chosen. You don't have good sense. I'm not reading any more of yours. You are. He says, faith, hope, and love. Thank you for sharing. I'm not thanking you with all of your lies that you've been talking here. You don't know nothing. All you need to do is watch about 50 of my messages on predestination. Then you'll know something about it. John Wilson commented on Billy Graham, the world's most famous lying false teacher. You sound like a Calvinist, are you? I never read John Calvin until I was about 40. I studied Bible from the time I was 18 on up. I didn't learn predestination from John Calvin. I've never really read a lot of John Calvin. John Calvin wasn't a Calvinist. You don't call, you don't name a movement after somebody till they're dead. Now, most Calvinists say they believe babies go to hell. John Calvin said in Augustus Strong's theology book, he said, the doctrine that babies are yanked from their mother's breast to be cast into hell is a doctrine to be universally detested. That was Calvin's words. So the people that come up with that doctrine after he's dead and call themselves Calvinists, the Calvinists say they believe in predestination, but most of them believe in predestination light. L-I-T-E, kind of like Bud Light. You won't get too good drunk on it, you know. And I've never drank Bud Light, but that's what I hear. That's enough said about this guy. M. Cube uh, commented on doctrine of the devil, cast out kingdom of God, strong man. Hi, where does the Bible say Israel was called the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven? If you look at at uh, the 12th chapter of 1 Samuel. And Samuel is warning Israel, if you go after these gods, God's going to send all these judgments, sword, famine, pestilence upon you. And he said, you got to remember, you've asked for a king among you when God was your king. Who's he talking to, Israel? Who would be the kingdom of God? The king of Israel. Israel. Israel was God's kingdom. And you can also find that in Hosea, the 13th chapter. God was the king of Israel. And who was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. The Pharisees took up stones to stone him at the end of John 8 because he said that and uh, said, we'll kill you for that. Call yourself God. So he's, Jesus said, I am the God of the Old Testament. Therefore, he was the king of the Jews in the Old Testament, or he was the king of the kingdom of God. You, it's, you can't just have a sentence to get every answer you want. You've got to be able to correlate Scripture with Scripture and put it together. All right. Now, where was I? I was reading here. Um, 
God is angry when we partake of Easter and Christmas. Why does God tell us he's angry with the wicked every day? Because he is. <laughs> what do you mean, why is he angry? I keep saying this. Let me say it again, okay? God creates evil. He said he did. God created sin. How did he create sin? He made Adam out of corrupt dust. And he said, that tree over there, the day you eat, you will die. He didn't say, if you eat, you will eat. He made him of corruption. Just watch my DVDs on Genesis, the first chapter. He made him out of corruption. So when he made him out of corruption or corrupt dust, he knew he was going to sin. So he makes evil. He makes sin in order to have mercy. Mercy has to be measured against wrath or anger. If there was no such thing as the wrath of God or anger, what would you call mercy? You would call it... Uh, uh. It would have no definition, would it? Without up, without a top of a building, how, without down, how can you have up? You've got to have something that is in opposition to have the definition of a word. Mercy, L-E-I-O, E-L-E-O-O. -E Mercy to the Jew was, just, was not pity. It was actually taking someone what they need, giving to them need. So how can God be angry with the wicked? God created evil so he could be angry at it. Boy, that's a hard thing to fathom, isn't it? But that's why he created it, so we could have... God wanted to express... Romans 9, 22. God willing to show... It doesn't say his wrath. It says te or gay. the feminine gender, or gay. Or gay is the anger and rage of a covetous man. God's willing to show man's rage. He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. But God wanted to show man's rage so he could put him in hell and be pleased with that and be angry at him. Without anger, without rage... God's love doesn't mean anything. Without rage towards people say, why would he send somebody to hell on purpose for that reason? All right. He goes on to say, when God gave command, he initiated choice. He did not. He didn't initiate a choice to Adam. He didn't say, if you eat, he said, the day you eat, you will die. Free will to choose. You are as ignorant of that as a guy. S.A. I don't know how men can believe this after you give them enough scripture. He makes no delight in the death of the wicked. He has no delight in the death of the wicked saints. You've got to go back and look at that again. Rather than turn from their own sin, he's not telling the wicked to turn from their sin. He's telling apostate Israel to turn from their sin. If my people, which are my people, my, possessive pronoun, I own them. If my people, which are caused, called by my name, will humble themselves. This does, it's not talking about vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. It's talking about believers who are living wrong. If my people, which are called by my, my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. But he's talking to believing Israel. And they've fallen away and apostatized. You've got to look at who God's talking to and who's doing the talking. Preaching a, preaching a false gospel other than go and sin no more, that's another story. 
I'm not even going to get into that. Some more, less and less, is not converted heart of a true believer trusting Jesus Christ. Well, you've got some messed up thinking, S and A. MPWCB writes, locusts, scorpions, false teachers, wolves, bottomless pit, know nothing. The scorpions work for God. <laughs> work for God. F scorpions are false teachers and can't stand the nasty evil. Boy, you're messed up as these other two guys. Scorpion, Scorpios. The verb form. In the Greek, you've got a noun and a verb. The verb form is scorpizo. That's the word scatter. That's the same word used. In John 10, the parable of the good shepherd, the hireling, the man that works for money, allows the wolf to come in and scatter the flock. Wolves are false teachers. Scorpions, scorpizo, scatter the flock. And besides that, in Ezekiel, the second chapter, the Lord tells Ezekiel, he's over here in Babylon. He said, you dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words. Scorpions have words. They don't work. The only way they work for God is to carry men down to hell. And he goes on to say, and they see in the world and lies that no one else can see through. I don't know where you got your definition for scorpions, but it's certainly not from the Word of God and not from a concordance. Have you got the seal of God on your forehead? That's funny. It's funny because I know what these people are thinking. Are you going to be wearing the smack in the face forever? And then he's got a little skull and crossbones there. No, he's teaching that... That is the fate of evil men, and you are a false teacher, and you should go and learn more, Jim Brown. <laughs> you know what you need? Get you, get you a tall yellow hat with a red ball on the front of it, on the top of it, and some yellow shoes and a big red nose, and go join the circus because you are a clown. You, you, these guys tickle me the way they write and just... <laughs> You can just go say anything they want to say. Trinity of God commented on how to study the interlinear Bible with strong concordance and the analytical lexicon. Thanks for the feedback. Here's another. What makes your words the truth? The Lord says, trust no other spirit. So your human words are your opinion from what your interpretation, what you read. Thank you for your response. I thought I'd re reply the way he's probably talking. Uh, Trinity of God, you're not the Trinity of God. There is a Trinity, but it's not you. That's for sure. Robert Dennis writes, What is the sons of God marrying the daughters of men at the end of time? Was Lucifer an angel? No. Lucifer's mentioned one time in the Bible, in Isaiah 14. Lucifer was a term for Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon. When you look at the first part of that chapter, the Bible says this is a proverb to the king of Babylon. What's being said in Isaiah 14? He's the one that said, I will send above the stars. I will lift my, myself above the Most High. Lucifer, Lucifer is the word H-E-Y-L-I-L. -L. It means shining one. It comes from the word H-I-Y-L-I-L, -L, which is the word we use when we say Halal Jah. The glory belongs to Jehovah. He was saying the glory belongs to me. I guess these people think they're going to trick me and get into something I hadn't studied. Was Lucifer an angel? Is he not the morning star? Halil means morning star. But who is the real morning star? He was a false morning star. Jesus is the bright morning star. The morning star was the Pleiades, and that will take me all day to get in through that. That's another subject. A son of God, did the serpent have seed? 
the seed of Satan was the serpent's words into Eve's ear. That's what it was. The children of the kingdom are cast out where the sons of God. Well, sons of God are those who do the will of the Father. Enough said. Janice LaFour said a message on Selah. Pay attention. Can you talk about the spiritual enemies you mentioned, please? Well, that'll have to be another subject. All right, I'm through reading, and I hope I answered some questions. Don't believe what most people want to comment on YouTube because YouTube, just everybody and his brother comes on there and makes comments, and most of it doesn't make any sense. For some reason, they watch one DVD or part of one DVD and thinks that they think that's all I know about the subject. Just, uh, I've done, I did four and a half years on the book of Revelation. I still didn't finish it. I went through nearly every word in the book, every culture, custom, idiom, metaphor that took me back to the kings of Israel, back to Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. And I still didn't finish it. And I came back and did about 25 or 30 more. I don't know how many. And I still didn't finish it. I did about three years on the book of Genesis. If you hear me preach on something, don't think you heard me preach everything I know about something because you heard one message. Everything I do is in series. I'm in a series right now. And boy, and it comes out of another series and just keeps going. Now, uh, if you want a free DVD, all you have to do is call us at my home number here in Hendersonville, 615-824-8502. I will answer the phone. People are so surprised when I answer the phone. Or you can call our 800 number, 1-800-625-5409. Uh, you want a free DVD, just call. And if I'm not there, I've got a phone answering and it'll answer, and you can leave your name and number. And if you want to stay on the list to get everything we do, not everything we have done, as of today, we've got 4,080 master DVDs. That would take you a long time to get that. And people write and say, I want everything you've ever done. Well, you'll have to move here, become an employee of the ministry, and work full-time making DVDs for yourself because it'll take you a long time to make them. Just uh, all you have to do is call. We give away the gospel without charge. We don't charge anybody anything for truth. Uh, Paul said, I give the gospel without charge. When I first started doing that in 1989, when we started this ministry, I thought, what if a whole bunch of people call and they want these and we don't have the money? It's not going to be a lot of people that want Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, God doesn't love everybody. God creates evil, God created sin, and all the rest of that. It ain't everybody that wants that. Only a few want the truth, and that's God's elect family. And uh, we only ask for money for one thing. We don't ever ask for money for the ministry. We ask for one thing, for the poor and the needy. I've got a list of poor and needy people uh, I go to the bank. I'll be going probably in the next couple of days, right at the first of the month, and I get about $2,500 in cashier's checks to give to the poor and the needy widow, widow ladies. I've got widow ladies that make six, $700 a month. After they pay $400, 450 500 for a little bitty dinky apartment in a bad part of town, they don't have any money left to buy groceries. So after they pay 450 a month and 200 a month for their for their uh, utilities, they got nothing left. So we send them money. The DVDs are free. If God deals you the heart, make your check that you send to the needy. Put make it to Grace and Truth Ministries. Put on the bottom of the check needy, and put how much you want to go to the needy. And if you want to give to the ministry, put right by that or under it or above it, tithe and how much you want to go 
to the ministry, but we don't ask for the ministry. And you're getting the DVDs doesn't have anything to do with whether you give or not. All you have to do is stay in touch. Uh, we're on TV in Nashville. Uh, we're on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, Comcast TV, channel 49. And that's Comcast TV, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, and Sunday morning at 9, channel 49. And then we're on radio every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock on WNQM. WNQM is 1300 on the AM dial. That's every Saturday morning at 9. Then we're on WNAH. That's 1360 on the AM dial. Just turn the dial a little way over. Of course, you don't turn it with a knob anymore. Just punch your moving button, and you'll go over to 1360, and we're on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, nearly all day long. I don't know how in the world they sold us that as cheap as they did. But we're on Monday through Friday, 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning, nine in the, 9.30 in the morning, and then we're on in the afternoon at 1.30, and then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So you can turn on 1360 and we're on nearly all day long. And then we're on Saturday at 7 in the morning, 10.30 in the morning, 12.30 right afternoon, and 1.30 every uh, Sunday, 1.30 in the afternoon. And the DVDs are yours free. And the Lord, we're on TV all over the country, on the Internet around the world. We've got people sending offerings from all over the world. And if you want to be a part of this and send money to help us, it takes about 12000 a month just to pay our TV bill. And then we've got, a, we've got five full-time workers and two part-time workers. And it takes a lot to keep this going. But that's between you and God, not between me and you. I do not ask anybody to give. I believe people have a, have a conviction in their heart to give if they want this truth to go to the world. Whatever you give does not go into my pocket. I have a salary, and it will never go up. And uh, we have a building fund. We want to get enough money together to build a small building. The most we need at the very top would be a building seat 150. I wouldn't even, don't even know with that much because most people don't want this message. That's the way it is. We're here in Hendersonville. We don't have four or five people come to church from Hendersonville. And most of them come from 50 miles this way and 50 miles this way. And, and they see us and hear us on TV and on the Internet. Well, we're, I'm... Uh, if you want to give, you can also send a gift card in the mail if you'd like to give that way. Or you can go on PayPal and send your offering through PayPal. Well, I'm ready to teach. And uh, so, Mike, if you're ready, I'm ready. I think I've already taught. I say that every week. I've given you enough information for about 25 years in a Baptist church. If they ever preach that much, I don't think you could get that much information 25 years in a Baptist church. You can't get that many Greek words in, in 50 years in any churches. I'm just amazed at the world.
I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher at Grace and Truth Ministries. I just read a bunch of emails. Uh, we put those on the inter internet also. So you can go on the internet and watch all these comments that we do. And uh, I'm teaching on something that it offends a lot of people, uh, especially so-called conservative Bible believers in America. Um, it's been a, it's been a, about the last four to five weeks, I've been teaching on how to study, how to study, study. This is, I think, number four, number five. The Strong's Concordance. Strong's Concordance. I'll just put C there. With an interlinear Bible. People say, is that a new version? No, that's the original text. Interlinear Bible with an analytical lexicon. I can't spell what I'm talking. Lexicon means dictionary. And there's some books I'm introducing you to. The Interlinear Bible is the original, what's called Textus Receptus. Here it is right here. And you can get one. Anybody can get one. It has, I've said this every week, but it has the Greek on the top line, and it has the English right under it. But I don't even trust, fully trust, the English of an interlinear Bible. I certainly don't trust the copy that these guys made. All I'm interested in is the Greek text. That's all I'm interested in. I use the English to locate the word. I'll use the verses and the English word. Once I get a hold of that word, I'm not interested in the English anymore. The Old Testament has the square letters, and you read from right to left and that. Just getting an interlinear Bible and reading an interlinear and trying to get your truth out of it, don't try to read the English. That's not even the purpose of an interlinear. The purpose of an interlinear is to look at that Greek text and copy the word down. Now, in the... I keep saying this, and I'm going to... long as I'm teaching on how to study. How do you know how to study? I've been studying for 65 years. Am I a Greek authority? No. I know something about the Greek. I know a lot about the Greek words and something about something about conjugation, something about participles and adjectives and adverbs and infinitives, and the list goes on and on. But I don't believe there's any such thing as an expert on Greek. The Greek text of people say, do you read, do you speak Greek? Nobody speaks this Greek. This Greek is a dead language. The Greek that they speak in Greece is not this Greek. This is the common street language of the first century. And every child five and six years old was speaking some form of it. So it shouldn't be that hard or that difficult. Now, I've been trying to show you. I use this right here. This is out of Mr. Machen's first year of Greek. He was, uh, he was a Greek scholar, and I got the book here somewhere. He was a Greek scholar, and he, here it is right here, G. Gresham Machen. He was uh, an authority on Greek. He wrote this book. This is New Testament Greek, for beginners. When you get this, don't expect you'll learn all this stuff all at once. You'll learn a little bit at a time. But what you do is you go back here into the back, and they have an index, and you can look things up. This is the page where I got this that's on the Internet right here. This is the page right here. 
This is parsed all these words. To parse means to divide up in a sentence. Well, let me just go ahead and show you this one more time. The, this is the word they. I've said this so many times. Anytime we've got three articles, an article is the same thing as an adjective, but they call these articles the, a, and an. Now, anytime you see a or an, you can cross that out because a and an are indefinite articles and they don't have indefinite articles in the Greek. They have a definite article, and not only that, but they got 24 ways to spell it. Anytime you see a thousand years, cross that out, because it's not thousand, it's the word kilia, and it's plural, it means 2,000 or more. I don't know why preachers don't say that. I, I don't know why the translators did, did some of the things they did. I'm going to read to you a little bit. They've messed up. A lot of the, the translators messed up the King James Bible. They translated the King James from 1605 to 1611. Now, back in that day and time, they would say tongue instead of language. Of course, there's two words for tongue. The reason they said tongue, because if some knight was riding along, and he ran across a young man, he'd say, Forsooth, young knave, what tongue dost thou speak? Well, forsooth means of a truth, and tongue is the word language, and knave is a young man. So he was saying, young, young man, what language are you speaking? You're speaking some foreign language. That's what he was saying. Well, there's two words for tongue in the Greek, glossa and dialectos. Dialectos. Now, I know that Pentecostals are not going to like this, but that's their problem. Dialectos. Dialectos is our word dialect. They had a different dialect in every city state. And glossa means foreign language. Heteroglossa is the word other tongue. In Acts 2, it means other foreign languages, it means foreign language. Dialectos means a dialect. They had a different dialect. The Jews had been scattered all over the world because all the time they were a nation, they kept going after these sun and tree gods. And the fourth judgment of God was the beast. That was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And you can see that in Daniel, the seventh chapter, and in Revelation, the 13th chapter, you see the Babylonian lion. I'm not going to go through that. I've gone through it already. The Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, and the beast with iron teeth, that was Rome. Now, over here, this is, like I said, here is the word the. There's 24 ways to spell it, depending on what case it's in. Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative case. I've gone through that over and over. Nominative case is either the predicate, nominative, or the subject. The genitive case shows possession, baptism. Just the case in this proves that baptism is not water. Baptism of repentance. Of repentance is one word in the Greek. And when you look up repentance in this verse, it will say genitive case. What it means is re true repentance possesses what baptism is. Well, that's not water. That's blood. Blood baptism was a death. It was a martyrdom. Now, I'm not going to spend as much time as I need to on that, but this is the word the. Depending on where it is in the sentence, that's the subject of predicate nominative. Genitive shows possession. Dative case is the indirect object. An accusative case is the direct object. It receives the action of the verb. Jim threw the ball. Ball is the direct object that Jim threw. It just receives the action of through. And then here is the word, and of course it depends on if it's masculine, feminine, or neuter. I went through this feminine gender when Jesus said, I am the way, I am taste. He told the apostles, I am the feminine way in you. 
how can Jesus be the feminine way? He said, the way you know, because he was talking to the bride, the wife of Christ, a nucleus of the church there in John 14. So it actually says, I am the feminine way. You can't translate that properly. It's not possible. Now, then you get down here to the word good. You got good. Uh, this, uh, this has 24 plus one more in the vocative case. Vocative is a direct address. It's the same thing when Jesus said, many will come and say, Lord, Lord. That's a direct address that would be in the vocative case. Then, then you've got these other ways to spell good. When the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good, it's this word right here, nominative, masculine, singular. I keep telling you, the only thing Mr. Strong will give you is this case right here, nominative, masculine, singular. Anytime you look up something in Strong's, it'll be that word right there. These are other words are the same word, but it depends on if they're, they're uh, neuter, neuter gender, feminine, or masculine, or where they are in the sentence. That's all it means. That is the basic word. When you look it up in Strong, it gives you the basic definition, the nominative case, masculine, and singular. Well, you get your basic definition, but you don't get other words. I've said this over and over. I love to say it. It's just something I love to say. The word whosoever is nowhere in the Greek text. It is not Greek. Whosoever. Boy, people, every time they see that, they say, they want to put will after it. Whosoever will. There's free will right there. I'm sorry it's not in the Greek text. Tough. <laughs> whosoever is never. It's one. Every time you find it, you, this is where you've got to. Well, I better tell you this first. When you look it up in Strong's, it will say, Ho, hey, to. That's all it will say. And that's not true. I don't know why Mr. Strong did that. All that is the, the, the. The masculine, the feminine, the neuter. That's all it says. It's just not true. How are you going to find out what it says? That's one place you have to go to an interlinear Bible. you got to go in here, and it'll tell you exactly what it says. Now, let me give you something. I've got a paper up here that I went through a lot of these, and I investigated every, well, I won't say every time it says whosoever, but I investigated most of the times it says it. Let me erase this. This would be part three or part four or part five. I don't remember which. Tom will put it on there. But here's, let me just give you some of the words whosoever. In John 3, 16, the Bible doesn't say whosoever believeth in him because God doesn't love everybody. God so loved, so is an adverb. This is, how about 19... 53, 54 English class, okay? Now, that was when I was in, going into high school. 1953, I went into, I was a sophomore in high school, and 53, 54, then 55, 56, I graduated, graduated in 57. An adverb tells how, when, where. When, where. And these are the same parts of speech in the Greek as there are in the English. This is an adverb tells us, says, God so loved. He didn't love everybody. He loved Jacob and hated Esau. So puts a condition on the word loved. Adverbs modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. This modifies love. So is a reference back to verse 14. When Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and whoever looked lived. That's what it's referring to. But how are you going to look at how are you going to hear those words? The hearing, hearing, and the seeing eye of the Lord has made in both of them. You can't even hear Moses say, whoever looks lives. And you can't look without a seeing eye. And that's predestination. So that shows you that 
so begins predestination in John 3, 16. And then it says, love is the word agape. And how many times have I said agape is one of the words that's been translated to love. And then you have phileo, which this is not the word phileo. God doesn't phileo have affection for everybody in the world. It's the word agape. Agape is walking in the commandments of God, walking commandments. That's what Kittle's Dictionary of New Testament Greek Word says, and that's what 2 John 6 says. 2 John 6 says, this is love, this is agape, that we walk after his commandments. Well, that's what the Kittle's Dictionary says. That's a 10-volume set on Greek words, and it's got 34 pages just on agape. That's a lot. And then loved, that's walking the commandments of God. So God, in this fashion, loved the same way he loved Israel in the wilderness, those that looked lived, when the fiery serpents were biting them. They didn't die. And then he says, but God so loved the world. World is the word cosmos. That's what John 3.16 says, cosmos, but it's actually, it's actually accusative voice because it receives the action of love. The, the, the accusative case receives the action of the verb. So it re receives the action of loved. God loved. It receives the action of God through the verb loved. So it's actually in this case right here, so it's not spelled like Mr. Strong says. Mr. Strong says it's cosmos right here, nominative masculine singular, right there. It's where it is. It's actually in the accusative <coughs> case. It's, say, it's the same word, but it's cosmon, or in the Greek, K-O-S-M-O-N. An N is like a V. So it's actually cosmon. So God so loved, and it means orderly arrangement, and it's masculine and gender. Therefore, he loves the orderly arrangement of mankind in this fashion, that whosoever believeth in him. It doesn't say that. Strike whosoever out of your Bible everywhere you find it. It says that. This is what it says instead of whosoever believeth. That the believing All. That they believing all. Look here. Here's the ways to spell all. There's 24 ways to spell all. It's the word pos, P-A-S, nominative, masculine, singular. It's the word pos, P-A-S. That in the, the is the word hey, or ho, ho. Believing is the word P-I-S-T. E U O N. Pissed you on. This is an adjective. This is a participle, but that's a verbal adjective. That's also an adjective. An adjective has to carry the same number, singular or plural, has to carry the same number of the noun or the pronoun of pos that it modifies. So it modifies all, and this is singular, this is singular, the, believing is singular, and all is singular, and it's all masculine gender. It's one all. What is the one all? What is the one all? That the believing, for well, whosoever is such a stinking word, it don't belong in the Bible. It's not what every Greek teacher knows that. You guys call me and tell me, tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I dare you to do that. They know that. It's amazing that they say these things, that they put it in there. It says that they believe. There's one all that's believing. Believing is the verb form of faith. Faith is P, 
I S T I S. The S in the middle of a word is like an oval with a little flag on it. The S on the end of a word is like our S, except the bottom hook is smaller, shorter. So, whosoever's not there, let me just, I just said that again for everybody's sake. You got all these words, whosoever. James 2.10 says, whosoever shall keep the whole law. That's not the word whosoever. It's the word etis, E-I-T-I-S. Tis is a word that just means any. It's the same word as when the Bible says, God is not willing that any of us should perish. It's the same word as that any in Second Peter 3 and 9. And it means, of course, it says any of us, talking to the scoffers, E means if any, if any. But if is not a good word because there's not any if in God's, there's no contentions on us if we will do something. Then he, let me give you a few of these. I won't give you a lot. John 3, 15, 16, pas ho, pest you on. Then he says in Acts 2, 21, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that is the word pas hos. Pas hos. There's a dick critical mark there, and that's an H sound. Hos. Hos. Pas hos. Pas hos. We got hos up here. It's one of these here. I can't find it. But it's pas, ho, or it means the all. Now, then you've got in uh, Romans 10 and 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. It's not whosoever. It's pas, gar, hos. It means the, believe it, the, for the all, that's all it says, for the all. And you've got that in James 2.10. You got that in James 4 and 4. You got, and I've gone through here and got a majority of these words. And uh, it'll always say posho or poshos or something connected with the all. It never says whosoever. It's just not a good word. Now, I've shown you how that these translators, do you think you can translate as good as those guys? I don't know the Greek they knew, but can I be objective as they are? Oh, yeah. Objectivity means the ability to go with the exact facts by crucifying your own self. Can you crucify yourself enough to tell your mother the truth, your children the truth, your brother the truth? and tell them and not varnish the truth with polish and make it look good. Seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Plainness is the word parhesia. P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A. -R -R parhesia means to be blunt, to the point, not beat around the bush, do not circumvent something, Circumvent means to go around, beat around the bush. Here's the point. And you're beating around the bush. And that's circumventing. You're making somewhat of a semicircle around the people so you don't have to offend them. Plainness means to be blunt, but it doesn't mean to be abrasive and cutting. Just tell the plain, straight truth. When I'm out in public, I say... Did you know that Chris, it was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America? I'll say that to doctors. I'll say it to lawyers. And I don't just bluntly walk up and just terrify them. I'll say, can I ask you something? They say, sure. I say, did you know that? Most of them will say, I, I'm not familiar with that. The reason our Bible, even the King James Bible, has got all kinds of error in it. Not the Textus Receptus. You understand what I'm saying? 
So I look at, I look for the word in a King James. I brought out the word orge last week. Even some of the Greek teachers will say, well, orge, O-O-R-G-E, it's feminine gender. Even one of the great scholars in America, Mr. Mounts, says in this book, the Greek for Beginners, he says the orge can be God's anger and wrath. Cannot. It's, it cannot, Mr. Mounts. God is not a female. I know why they said that. They said that because they didn't like what the Bible actually says. God said in Romans, the first chapter, that God placed the orge upon man. He doesn't like the idea that when man has a rage and anger, God put it on him. I said last week the way he did that, he made him out of corrupt dust. And then he said, thou shalt not, and the day you do, you'll die. He didn't say if you eat, but you will eat. Just like Adam, Adam ate, because he had to. He was made of corruption. I went through that last week, or this last message. You cannot, it's really hard to tell people. In Hebrews 3.11, the Bible says, so this is what the Bible, the King James Bible says. Hebrews 3 and 11, the Bible says, so I swore, and it looks like God's wrath because he's talking about the people murmuring, murmuring against God in the wilderness of previous verses. So he said, I swore in my wrath. Well, it's not my wrath. It looks like God's wrath from the previous verses. And it's not. This is why I believe they translated this. It says, te or gay. Any word that ends with an ada or with an ada nu is always feminine gender. That's feminine gender. They didn't want, they didn't like the idea that God says, so I swore in thee wrath, and the next word in the Greek text says, mu. M O U. It's Mu is of me. It says, The wrath that's in man. Orge was the anger and the rage of a covetous man who wanted to get even and get back. And God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. The word vengeance, D I K E. God says, I will make things right. That's the word right. So when they come up and say, the wrath of God is of me, they left out moo in the King James Bible. They left that out. And they come up and put my looking like God's wrath. It's not what it says. Let me read to you something out of where did all this come from? Here's a book. This is about the men who wrote, who, can, who translated the King James Bible. It's called God's Secretaries. I'm going to read a couple of pages from it, and this will help you to understand. There were 53 translators of the King James Bible. I'm not trying to put down the King James. I'm not a King James only person. I'm a TR person only, Texas Receptus. And here's why. Let me read a couple of pages on this. This is, it talks about at the front of the book when James the sixth, King James the sixth was the, he was the incoming king of England. 16, oops, I'll get it in a minute. Let me erase this. 1603, 1603, James the sixth. He was the king. You had, 
you had James the first, James the second, James the third. It was King James the sixth that was behind the translation of the King James. And this was in 1603, and the tremendous black plague was rampaging across Europe. And it was hit in England in 1603. The black plague, or the bubonic plague, they had many names for it, hit England between the thir early 1300s through the 16, about 1665. It would come and then it would go. It would come and then it would go. It rampaged like this through all the continent of Europe. It would sweep through Italy. I keep saying the COVID virus is from God. And it's amazing what some of these Puritans said about this bubonic plague and where it came from. Amazes me. Sounds like me talking. Let me read this. There was something strange about the plague. It seemed to pick and choose its victims. Why Nicholas Bond, a Puritan Sabbatarian, had the answer. His pamphlet, Medicines for the Plague, published in 1604, is alive with both the appalled anxiety of the time and terrifying certainty certainty over God's role in it. For what is the cause of this pestilence? Sounds like COVID-19. Is so greatly in one part of the land and not another. In the same city and town, and why is it one part in one house and not in another? And the same house, why is it upon one and not upon the rest? When they all line together and draw in the same breath and eat and drink together and lodge in the same chamber, yea, sometimes in the same bed. Sounds like coronavirus. What is the cause of this? But that it pleaseth the Lord in wisdom for some cause to defend and some for a time and not the rest. Therefore, let us believe that in these dangerous times, God must be our only defense. Sounds like what I've been saying, doesn't it? As another teacher, Thomas Pullian, said in Jeremiah's Tears, published in 1608, the plague is nothing but the will of God, rightful, punishing, wicked men. How many times have I said that? Over and over and over. Enoch... Clampham, a wild and cantankerous Puritan controversialist, claimed in 1603 pamphlet that people who saw anything in the plague but the working of the divine will were atheists, mere naturians, and other ignorant persons. Clapham has seen men and women walking in streets the amazing thing about 1603 is that the Inquisition, the Catholic persecution was rampaging at that time as well. They were killing Christians all over Europe, the European continent, and over England for not partaking of the sacrament of the Mass, which is Christ's Mass. Suddenly stumble collapse, clearly knocked down by one of God's avenging angels. One only had to inspect them afterwards to see the plain spirit of the blue hand left behind upon the flesh. And what had medicine to do with that? The modern use of the word stroke to mean an apoplectic seizure is a faint memory of that angelic blow. By midsummer of 1604, London under plague now looked, sounded, and smelled like a city at war. It was by far the most, the worst outbreak in England had known. And James VI was ascending the throne. Here now, grippingly and shockingly, the first and greatest Bible translator appears on the scene. The greatest translator of the Bible was Roman Catholic. Listen to what it says. 
It is not dignified slight. It, it is not a dignified sight. Lancelot Andrews. Lancelot, remember Hans Lancelot? He was a part of the, the uh, Arthurian legend. And the best scholars will tell us the Arthurian legend were, were thinly veiled fire and tree deities. I'm not going to go into that right now. Same thing as Christmas. Lancelot Andrews was a man deeply embedded in the Jacobin establishment. That means the European establishment. He was 49 or 50, master of Pembroke College, Cambridge. He was also dean of Westminster Abbey. Now, get this guy. He's a Catholic. He's the head of that translating committee. A prebendary pre 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 of St. Paul's Cathedral, drawing the income from one of the cathedral's manors, and of Southwell Minster, one of the chaplains of the Chapel Royal in Whitehall, who under Elizabeth, Elizabeth was an outgoing queen. She's the one that died, that caused James, who was living in Scotland. King James was the heir to the throne of Scotland, the throne of France, and the throne of England. And King James' mother was not Elizabeth. His mother was Mary, Queen of Scots, who was also an heir to France, France's throne, Scotland's throne. Scotland didn't have much of a throne or an army. They were kind of a two-bit country. England was the big part of this empire. Under Elizabeth had twice turned down the bishopric, or the pastorship, not because he felt unworthy of the honor, but because we're talking about Lancelot, Lancelot Andrews, because he did not consider the income of the sees, S-E-E-S, that's the prognosticators or the bishops. He was offered satisfactory. It didn't, wasn't enough money for him. Elizabeth had done much to diminish the standing of the bishops. She had banished them from the court and effectively suspended Edmund Grindall, the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury, when Henry VIII started the Church of England, he appointed his own pope and called him the Archbishop of Canterbury. And they kept all of these all of these rituals in the Church of England or the Anglican Church. They kept to walking down the aisle next after the Eucharist. Who's severe? Elizabeth forbid this Edmund Gris Grindel, the Bishop of Canterbury, who's severe and Calvinistic views. <laughs> that amazes me that the head of the Church of England had Calvinist views was not to her liking. Andrews, one of the most astute and brilliant men of the age and ecclesiastical politicians who in the Roman church would have become cardinal and perhaps even pope. Ah, this, this Lancelot Andrews was up to be the pope. And he was head of, the, head of this translating committee and the most powerful man involved in it. Well, and he, I'm sure he had to do with bringing in the other Catholics. Not, was not going to diminish his prospects simply to carry an elevated title. Andrews plays a central role in the story of King James' Bible. A Catholic man was up to be the Pope. And the complexities of his character will emerge as it unfolds. He is, in many ways, its hero. He's the hero of the King James Bible. Now, I believe in the King James Bible more than any other Bible because it comes from the right text. But there are errors in the King James Bible. And people will write to me and say, there's no error. It's the inspired Word of God. We have the inspired Word of God in the Greek text. As broad as the great Bible itself, scholarly, talking about Lancelot Andrews. He was scholarly, political, passionate, agonized in love with the English language. 
That's one of the problems there. Endlessly invigorating its possibilities, worldly, saintly, serene, sensuous, courageous, craven, if not corrupt, then at the least compromised. That's what Lancelot Andrews was. He was compromising. Deeply engaged in the pastoral care, generous loving, in public, bewitched by ceremony. In private, he was troubled by persistent guilt and self-abasement. So he wasn't that right of a man. And he's more or less in head of this translation. Roman Catholic man that was up to be Pope, possibly. But in the grim realities of stricken, plague-stricken London in summer of 1605, he appears in the worst possible light. He doesn't look good. Among many positions in the church, he was the vicar of St. Giles Cripplegate just outside the old walls to the north of the city. And I'll just read a little bit of the next sentence. It's amazing the men that were in charge of translating the King James Bible, half of them Roman Catholics, I'm sure procured by Lancelot Andrews, brought in. They did a lot of compromising. But in the grim realities of plague-stricken London in 1603, the worst possible light, the church was magnificently, beautifully repaired after a fire in 1545, full of the tombs of knights. The knights rode in their great chargers, aldermen, goldsmiths, physicians, rich men, and their wives. And there were about 4,000 people in Lancelot Andrews Parish. By December 1603, 2,878 of them were killed by the disease. Now, that's just a little bit. I may read you some more, but it's just showing you the people that were in charge was the Roman Catholics. I don't know how much commitment they had, but it says in that article that he was in love with the English language. So he was translating according to his bent, however he was bent toward. Now, I'm trying to show you some of these books. I've been talking to you about not only did the Roman Catholics twist the King James Bible, but so did the Pharisees. I've said this already, and I've, I'm kind of teaching on the same subject. It's kind of like taking a class in college, and the professor resumes the subject the following week or the following class. That's kind of what I'm doing. Now, the Pharisees had a twisted version of the Bible. All through the Scripture, I believe, you say, I don't know Greek. Well, you can learn it. You don't have to learn the Greek. Just learn this alphabet up here, and you can look at it. You can take the alphabet and look the word up in an interlinear Bible, and it'll tell you exactly what the word is. It might be in the nominative case. It might be in the dative case or the accusative case. And it may be feminine gender instead of masculine like they've translated. Or it might be neuter gender. I said to you last week, I've said it a couple of times, when the Bible says the beast, there in Revelation 13, Revelation 13, the beast when you look it up, Tolterion, the beast is neuter gender. And it was like a lion, bear, and a leopard. Well, it cannot be a man like when it says the dragon gave him his seat, his power, and his great authority. It can't be a him because when you go back over here originally to the beast in Daniel 7, the beast was a lion, a bear, and a leopard, and the beast with iron teeth. The beast was a system over here. Why is it a man over here? Well, it's not. That's where the King James Bible mistranslated the beast. 
It didn't mistranslate the beast. It translated, mistranslated him and his. The dragon gave him his seat, his power, and his great authority. Well, his and him is not what it says. His and him. It says it gave autu, A-U-T-O-U. Autu is, it comes from the stem, auto, A-U-T. That's the stem of the word, auto. The stem is the part of a word that has the meaning that everything's built upon. Well, this word auto, when you go into the different endings on auto, you have A U T O, and that's masculine gender. The word endings are changed depending in the text as to, as to masculine or feminine or neuter gender. And then you have A U T Ada. It's just a form of our word auto, it means self. Self. And then with the Ada, it's feminine gender, so it's her. So self and him and her are all forms of the same word. Self is auto. Her is auté. Is that important? Well, yeah. In Ephesians 5.25, the Bible says, Husbands, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself and it says in the King James Bible, for it. It's not it. The church isn't an it. It says, Alte, her. That's who he died for, his wife, the church. Is that, a, is that wrong to do that? Certainly it's wrong. I don't know which one of the translators put it in there. It's not right. It would be neuter gender. It. Well, that's like all two. That can either be, that can either be mas masculine or neuter gender. That's exactly what Mr. Mount says. And it has to follow the gender of the antecedent. The antecedent is the noun or pronoun that a pronoun refers back to. So autu refers back to the beast, which is neuter gender. It cannot be him. It cannot be his. It doesn't even say him or his in the interlinear Bible. The translators got it right. They put its. That's what it should be because it was an it over here, and God doesn't have an it over here that it turns into a man over here. Everybody's looking for a man to come on the scene because Revelation 13 says the beast gave him, the dragon gave him his power, his seat, his great authority. It's not a him, it's an it. It's a new world order. It's a thing. It's a system. It was the same thing in the Old Testament. Why isn't it the same over here? Well, it is. But just because it's got him or his Everybody's looking for a man. Is there a man that's going to be heading that up? Well, certainly there is. But he's not the beast. The man is the man of sin. And there's many names for him throughout the Bible. The word Antichrist is only mentioned in First and Second John. And the Bible says anyone that denies Christ is Antichrist. First John 2, 22. Deny Christ contradict it's the word arneomai a-r-n-e-o-m-a-i well, how do you deny Christ it's what you do Paul said in Titus 1.16 some men profess that they know God same exact word as confess Homo legao. Homo legao comes from homo and logos. Homo means of the same. We know what that is. A homosexual is of the same sex. It's a Greek word, just like hetero is a Greek word. They spoke with 
heteroglossa, other tongues. It's Greek, means other. Homologeo, some men profess that they know God, Titus 1.16. Well, I love this, Titus 1.16. Some men profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him in ergon. They're tall. They work for themselves and they don't work for God. In works they deny. Deny is the word on It means they contradict God by what they do so they don't confess Christ. You only confess Christ when you say His words with your mouth and you do them. Well, so auto, auto can be masculine or neuter gender depending on the antecedent. The antecedent of him is the beast. It's like Jim went to the store. He bought bread. Well, he is the... The antecedent of he is Jim. It refers back to Jim. Well, the antecedent has to have the same gender and the same number, one, singular, one. It has to have the same gender and the same number as the, as the antecedent. So this is true in the Greek. The Greek books will tell you that. So... This word autu has to be neuter gender. Therefore, the beast is a system and it's not a man. That's where the King James messed up. I don't know why they did that. I believe it was Roman Catholics got a hold of some of this. And people are going to say, what are we supposed to do? Read the, read the Greek text? I'm going to, I mean, you know, use the King James Bible and refer back to the concordance and refer back to the interlinear Bible. It's a shame not hardly many people even know about an interlinear Bible. I have people call me from all over the country off our TV and off the Internet. I say, you need an interlinear Bible. First, you need a strong concordance. Then you need an interlinear Bible. They say, I don't even know what that is. Isn't that amazing? That has the exact text in it. And people don't even know what it is. If you want to look up a word, be sure you get it. Look it up in Strong's, then check and see if it's the same word in here. But in the Strong's, it'll only be nominative. It'll be nominative case, masculine, singular. Do you need to know that this is, that this is neuter gender? Yeah. Then you have... I'm, I'm not a Greek teacher. I know some Greek, but I don't know, know a whole lot. Studying the Greek language is very tedious. All I'm doing is taking you to some words so you can understand you have aute, you have A-U-T-O-U, -U, and then you have E, A-U-T-O-U. T, there's the stem, O, N. That's masculine gender. This is the word right there. A-U-T-O-N is the word in Luke 9, 23. It doesn't say if any man come after me. If is not a Greek word. It says, any man after me, let him deny, deny himself. And it doesn't just say A-R-N-E-O-M-A-I. That's the word deny, but it has a prefix on it. Prefix is op, A-R-N-E-O-M-A-I. In the, in the, uh, NIV that comes out of the West Cotton Hort text, it doesn't say aporneomai. It says arneomai. Arneomai can mean one time. 
Well, you don't deny self one time. You deny, you set off self daily, every day, the same way you do when you repent. Metanoia, M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. That's the word repent. It means to be turned and think differently. Well, when you look at the word repent, Luke 13, the 13th chapter, 13 and 3, the Bible says, except you repent, you will all likewise perish, except you emeta, neo. You've got verbs and nouns all through these. Metanoia, or metanoia means to be turned And that metanoia, when you look it up in a parsing guide, it will tell you it's present tense, subjunctive mood. When you couple present tense with subjunctive mood, that means constantly over and over and over again. You have to repent every day because you have to die to the flesh daily. That's what you have to do. Why do you have to do it? Because the Bible says so. Why do we have to repent daily? Well, we are humans. We have a tendency when we get up in the morning and we start our life, we have a tendency to get involved in sin. And then God deals with us and turns us around. We do that the next day. And then the longer you live, it gets longer in between turns. Sometimes you start to turn and then you get back where you're supposed to be. That's called conviction. And the longer you live and the older you get, the more God will turn you. I'm in a, I'll be 82 here in May the 16th. I'm in a state of repentance every day. If you're not in a state of repentance at 82, you're crazy. You really don't believe God. God has to, and you say, but Jim, I know some older people that are not. Well, how long have they been believing the truth? You can have a little faith. I had a fellow used to come here. We called him Big Al because he was a great big guy, and he looked like Santa Claus. It's way exactly what he looked like, big white beard and white hair. And he'd come up to me and he'd say, Jim, I'm about 55 at the time. He'd say, Jim, I'm in my 70s, and I'm just a baby. I said, I know that. I don't expect as much from you as I do these people that's been believers for all their life. So he's he's going to have a tougher time turning. Of course, he's dead now. He's long dead. But baby believers are not going to be turned as... They're, they're going to be having to be turned more because they keep going back to sin daily. That's what the present tense subjunctive mood is about. It means over and over and over, except you continually repent. But if Christ is in you, that goes back to that inner and outer man, doesn't it? That goes back. You have an inner man that serves the law of God. That's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think I finished up with that. E e auto. The thing is, you have to, the E A U T O N or E A T O N, that's an N in the Greek. The T is like a T, the U is like a U, and the A is like an A. This E, that is on the front of a word in front of pronouns, and particularly in front of verbs. In front of a verb, it's called an augment and it has something to do with the character of the word it's like putting a u t o e d it's like putting autoed that's something that was done in the past that's the same thing paul said when he said i thank god i baptized none of you but christmas and guys that word baptize is the word e B A P T I S S O. Baptizo is a form of baptizo. And I baptize, the E is on there to show that was something that Paul did in the past. 
Well, that was proselyte baptism. We don't baptize in water here. The Bible doesn't teach that. Well, Jesus was baptized in water. I know that. That was a Pharisee baptism. I keep saying this. I hope you get a hold of it. The Pharisees had their own baptism. They had their own doctrine, and they did the same thing the preachers are doing in America today. Did the same thing. They're taking a Bible verse, and they're making it mean whatever they want it to mean. My pet peeve about the Charismatics is probably their favorite verse of all the things they quote. 3 John 2. I put this on the board 500 times if I put it once. John says to Gaius, I wish above all things. That ought to give him some signal. Above all things. 3 John 2. Above all things. Here's what I wish for you. John tells Gaius. John to Gaius. Above all things, here's what I want for you, that you'll prosper and be in health. So Kenneth Copeland and T.D. Jakes, they take this word and they do what the Pharisees did. They rich it. That's what the Bible says, men that rich the word of God. There in Second Peter that third chapter. They rich the Word of God. They torture the Word. That's what the Bible calls it. They torture the Word of God because they are unlearned. Unlearned is the word amathes. A-M-A-T-H-E-S. Mathes is a form of the word mathetes. Mathetes is the word learner. It is the word disciple. If you learn, you're going to have to go by the mathematical rules. You've got to go by the axioms. Axiom is a mathematical rule. By the way, axiom is a Greek word. Axios. A-X-I-O-S. Or A-X-I-O-O. Axiao means equitable. Or what it means is this side is equal to this side. That's what it means. It means equal. Well, that's the word axiao. When a man partakes unworthily, he's not talking about partaking of crackers and grape juice. There in the 11th chapter of Second of First Corinthians. To partake unworthily meant to go to the festivals after you have come in contact with a dead body. They had to go out on the road. Here's Israel. Well, here, let's look at Israel here. They had to go out on the road and they had to, they had three festivals that all the men had to come to. They had to come to Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingathering, which was also coupled, it was another name, was the Feast of Huts, uh, and it was coupled with the Day of Atonement, which was the tenth day of the seventh month. The seventh month was Tishri, and Tishri is our month, September, October. And the first month was Nisan in the Jewish calendar, and that's our month, March, April. And there in Exodus, the 23rd chapter and several other chapters, all the males had to come back to these festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of End Gathering, and they had to bring a lamb with them. And if they couldn't bring a, bring a lamb, if they were coming from over here in Carthage, you can't bring a lamb all the way to Israel. <laughs> Get along there. Get on this boat. Come on, lamb, move over here. They had to bring a half shekel to buy a lamb. And they bought these lambs there at the temple. 
Nothing wrong with buying and selling lambs at the temple. They had to for men that were traveling a long way and they didn't, wasn't able to bring a lamb with them. What was wrong when Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers? It was the money changers he was angry at. They were stealing from the foreigners, that the Jews coming from every nation under heaven. They were getting there. They were saying, this lamb, and they were exchanging the money. You have to exchange money if you go into Canada. You have to stop at the border and give them $100 if you, and they'll give you so much money back in change, maybe 115 or 100 depending on what the exchange rate is. What they were doing was stealing from the people. And Jesus said, my father's house is a house of prayer and you made it a den of thieves. You're stealing from the people. It wasn't buying and selling lambs that was wrong. So they're coming back from all over the world, coming over here to Jerusalem. And they all had to partake in these festivals. And because they had were scattered all over the world, all the time they were a nation from first Samuel, actually from Judges, from Judges through Second Chronicles, they kept going after these sun and tree gods, which was later on bought in the church and renamed the Christ Mass. Uh, I've gone over this a thousand times. It seems like everything I'm teaching ties with everything else. I can't get away from the subject. It all goes back to Israel being a nation in these years. There were a nation under kings about 510 years that kept going after Baal and the grove and Shemosh and Molech and, and Osiris and all the gods of Egypt and all the gods of, the, all the gods of Syria. And you can look at that. You can see them doing that in Ezra, the ninth chapter, the first few verses. And they're going after the Ammonites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, gods. So God scatters them all over the world. And I'm talking about prosper and be in health. I got over here for some reason. I don't remember why. I, just, I get on a subject. Well, we've got to get back to prosper. Prosper doesn't mean money. They've twisted. Well, what they did here is they twisted God's words in Israel. They twisted his words. That's why he scattered them. They're all over the world. And you can put tongues in with this. They're all speaking with all of these tongues. They've been scattered as of Pentecost for six to seven hundred years. And they're, got, and they're all over the world because God caused Assyria to come in and scatter northern Israel. He caused Babylon to come in in 586 B.C. to scatter southern Judah, which was comprised of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Northern Israel was the ten northern tribes, and they were ruled by Ephraim. So anywhere you see Ephraim after they're scattered, like in Hosea, Hosea indicts Ephraim, which was the second son of Joseph. And Ephraim had all of the inheritance of Israel, well, southern Judah was scattered, and they end up over here in Babylon. And that's where they start the synagogue. I've got all kinds of books on this. And when they get into the synagogue, they start, they say, we've got to have a law that will rule us. So what they did, they translated the Torah, they called the first five books of the Bible Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was the Torah. We call it Pentateuch, P-E-N-T-E-T-E-U-C-H. Pentateuch comes from pent, meaning five. A pentagram is a five-pointed star, like so. One, two, three, four, five. That's a pentagram. And Pentateuch means first five books. So they translated the Torah over to the Babylonian Aramaic. Babylonian Aramaic. And they did the same thing the preachers are doing today when with this word prosper 
and be in health. They twisted the meaning of the words over here in Babylon. So what they did, they started the Sunaga, S-U-N-A-G, or S-Y-N. It actually comes from Sun and Ago, S-Y-N-A-G-O-G-U-E. It comes from Sun and Ago. It means to lead, Ago, together. Sun is a common word. It's a common prefix in the Greek. It means to blend with. It has a little different meaning than meta. Meta means to accompany. Meta. Meta. Means to accompany. Soon means to blend with. Means to blend. That's, you have the word, you have many different variations of soon. Soon. Sug, su. All of these have basically the same meaning. Sumarphos, S U M M O R P H O S, means to be shaped in fellowship. Fellowship, that has the basic same meaning as K O I N O N I A. Kononia is the word partaker or fellowship or to have in common. So, Morphe means to be shaped, and that's what we're predestined to. We're predestined to be conformed to the image icon of Christ. Icon means likeness. All those that he foreknew, he's predestined to be conformed to the likeness. So, what they did over in Babylon is the same thing the Charismatics are doing today. It's the same thing the Baptists are doing today. I was raised in a Baptist preacher's home. I was ordained as a Southern Baptist preacher. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. I went before Mecklenburg Association, the same association that Billy Graham went before in the early 40s or whenever it was. And they examined me, and I gave them all their answers, and they said, we're putting our approval on his being ordained. And I don't agree with anything the Southern Baptists are doing anymore. Don't believe in accept Christ as your personal Savior. Don't believe in Christ as a personal Savior. Yeah, for the elect. But you won't accept anything till after he births you by his will. The natural man does not receive. Dekomai. Dek is the word ten. It means to reach out the ten fingers and accept an offer that's been given. Dek, a decade is ten years. Dekomai means to reach out the ten fingers and accept. Dead men don't accept anything spiritual. I don't believe in accept Christ. That frustrated me more than anything in my young life when my father would beg people down the aisle, say, I want you to come. This may be your last chance. There's no chances with God. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And every one of God's people will hear. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. I hate accept Christ in sinner's prayer for salvation. The sinner will pray after he's born again by the will of God, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Belief comes first. It precedes accept Christ. It precedes sinner's prayer. You can't pray to a God you don't believe in. Good grief. My father preached that. Y'all are looking at somebody. I was more frustrated than in any human alive. From the time I was 10, he started preaching you got to accept Christ, Jimmy. Come on forward. I walk the aisle over and over. If you don't know tonight, the Bible doesn't say that. That's a confusing thing. There's two common Greek words for the word no in the Greek text. Which one are you going to do? Ido and gnosko. These both, both have been translated into the word no. Is that okay? No, it's not okay. How can they translate it? There's no way to really translate it. English is a very harlot language. It sells out meanings. It's a terrible language. Gnosko means, we get the word gnosis from that, which is the word science. It means to know by learning. Ito means to see 
or perceive. The difference between these two words, ito means to, to personally be a personal witness to something. Gnosis means somebody told you. If you're coming up to a street here and there's a big car wreck there and somebody comes over to your house and tells you about it, that's gnosko. If you're there watching it happen, that's ito. When Paul said, I know whom I have believed, he used the word ito. He said, I, I've seen my life change. I'm an apostle, a preacher, and a teacher. Therefore, I ito who am I believe in. I have seen my life change. My father used to say, if you don't know tonight, and he was implying, gnosko. I never did gnosko. Hadn't learned anything. I was a kid. So being nervous as I was, I'd take off down the aisle again. I went down the aisle so many times, he dipped me about, him and two other preachers dipped me about seven times. <laughs> you talk about you know what that is? That is oppression of the baby sheep. My father oppressed me to know, and of course he oppressed everybody. He, he was a preacher, but he'd get ball bats after people, the hammers after him, two befores after him, and run over off the road with his cars and punch out his deacons in front of the church, on the church grounds. Of course, he never did keep people in his churches. He always went to a church that had 30 or 35 people in a year. He'd only have 15. That would be counting little old ladies and the kids. I don't know if you've ever been to a preacher's church like that. We'd like to rule with an iron fist. He was one of them. I'm not trying to defame my father's memory. He was that way. Everybody that knew him will tell you that. He was the most unforgettable character I have ever met. I've met a lot of people in my life. Now, so Paul said, I can see you, I believe, because... The people I used to kill are my friends now. I used to kill Christians for a living. And now the, I used to be a Pharisee killing Christians. I've seen myself change. You want to know about your salvation? Learn the word. Learn the truth. Change. And that's when you'll see what you used to be and what you are now. I'm not the man that I was at 30, 35, 40. Not even close to the man. I never get angry. I sound like I do up here in the pulpit, but I don't. The only people I'm angry with in the pulpit are the ones I'm commanded to be angry with. Then Ephesians, the fourth chapter, be angry at these winds of doctrine, these preachers that preach winds of doctrine, and they, they with sleight of hand, they, they, they preach something that tricks the people, and it makes the church apathetic. The word is apogeo. It means they're in a state of apathy. They've heard so many winds of doctrine in America. They're all confused. I heard the same thing when I was a kid. I had to grow up and study the Bible for myself to learn what these things meant. And I'm, you know, I've, I've said this to people. It sounds crazy. My father was crazy. I mean, he was a nutcase. He got mad every day. I mean, we didn't know when he would come in. He'd drive in the driveway. I'm eight years old, and I'd say, Oh, God, he's here. Oh, God, he's here. Oh, God, oh, God, what do I do now? I was terrified of him. I even told him that when I got older. But I'm going to tell you something. This sounds crazy. I'm really thankful that I had the father I had. I'm so grateful I had him. You know why? It made me think for myself. That's the only reason I learned these things. Made me think. So whatever you go through, you can be thankful for it. <laughs> That's hard to understand. I tell people, when something happens, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. My father's the reason I've studied the Bible so hard and so intently. The hunger was there as a kid. And I would pray when I was 17. I remember I was about 17 when I started praying, Lord, help me find the truth. I don't understand anything Daddy's saying. I heard a professor speak. 
my father had this professor from seminary between Dallas and Fort Worth come over and speak. And I heard all this information coming out of his mouth. I thought, I've got to learn that. And that was 65 years ago. That's the reason I think the way I think. I analyze everything. I analyze commercials on TV. I don't do it intentionally. I just do. It's there, and I go, well, that can't be true. Guy don't get a crown on his head because it's, it's tastes like butter. I mean, what are they talking about? And I would do that when I was young. I guess it's because my father said all these things, called me clumsy and ignorant and stupid. Don't treat your kids like that. Well, go ahead and treat them like that. Maybe they'll think. <laughs> now, so what they did when they're in Babylon, they took the they took the first five books of the Bible. They say there are six hundred and thirteen laws. That's what the Jews say. They translated over in the Babylonian Arab Babylonian Aramaic. Since they translated over from the Hebrew to the Babylonian Aramaic, there was a different there was a different Aramaic just like there was the Greek Koine, the common street language, like there was different dialects. There were different dialects of the Aramaic all over the civilized world. There was one in northern Israel, and it was the the northern Israel Aramaic dialect. So they said we've got to translate it, and what we've got to do is come up with we gotta we gotta have men explain. We have to have explainers. Or they called them interpreters. Interpreters of this of this law that we're bringing over to the Aramaic language. So they started what they call halakha. The halakha was where they took verses out of these 613 laws and they interpreted them for themselves. They did it leaning it towards their own welfare. And what they did it with, they had a head rabbi that equated with the high priest system over here in Israel. The high priest was in charge of everything, all the sacrifices in Israel. Well, they, they set up a, ra a rabbinical system, and they had rabbis under this head rabbi. And every time the head rabbi would die, they would appoint a new rabbi. And that rabbi could add to this halakha opinion, and they called that tradition. And any time the New Testament talks about the traditions of the Pharisees, when they were in Babylon, they were called the rabbis of the Babylonian synagogue. Synagogue is evil. So are the rabbis. And by the time you get down to Jesus Christ, and this thing they started building around 538 B.C., then when you get to Jesus, these same rabbis are called the Pharisees of the Babylonian synagogue. And every time a new rabbi would come in, they'd add opinions to their halakha. And as they got down to Christ, everything they had said, said. They called that the traditionary law. They called it the tradition, you look up tradition, it's the word paradosis. Paradosis means the traditionary law of Moses. A tradition is something passed down word of mouth. They said the halakha could not be written down. The only way you could understand it is the new head coming rabbi would come in and add his opinions to what it meant. That's the same thing they do when they say prosper and be in health. Prosper, E-U-O-D-O-O. -O -O. They say prosper means money. That's what Kenneth Copeland says. That's what T.D. Jake says. That's what Fred Price said before he died. They all say that. 
health is the word hugiano, H-U-G-I-A-I-N-O. And A-I-N-O. Hugiano is the same word that Paul would use when he would speak of sound doctrine. It means uncorrupt words. It doesn't mean physical health. I wish above all things that thou mayest all things. What do you think he wants for all things? Wants him to be rich and have the health of an Olympic athlete? That's not what he wanted. Prosper, whether people like it or not, it's the word E-U-O-D-O-O. Euodio is a construction of E-U, meaning well. You see that on eulogy, which is Greek. Eulogy means well words. This word you means well. Hodos means way. That's what euodio comes from, you and hodos. It means way. It means the well way. If there's a well way, there's a bad way. There's a well way, and that is narrow is the way. So that's wish. <laughs> These guys that say that's money and physical health, they're dodos. They're dumbbells. They're stupid. If they can't learn, they're stupid. They could be ignorant and learn. Ignorant just means unlearned. Stupid is the word brutish in the Old Testament and the New. It means to have the understanding of a brute beast that cannot learn. I've had some dogs like that. Had one named Charlie. He was an English bulldog. All he could do is sling his head and throw spit. I said, come here, Charlie. And he'd go, Wah. he wouldn't even come to you. He'd just throw spit. That's all he'd do. He was a brute beast, but he was lovable. These brute beasts, uh, brute beasts coping, those guys are not lovable. Do I have any time, Mike? Six. Six minutes. Anyway, here's, let me just show you some things. This is a set of books about the Halakal. They also had a Haggadah. They said the Halakal couldn't be written down. But by the time of Jesus, they had the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a book that's holy to the Pharisees, and you can get a copy of it. The Mishnah, Mishnah, M-I-S-N-A-H. This has written down that they say couldn't be written down in the Halakal. They also had the Haggadah, which is a commentary. And they say that couldn't be spoken aloud. And when you look up Talmud in your T volume of McClinic and Strong, it'll give you about 20 or 30 pages just on the Halakal and the Haggadah. And the stupid things they said, they would say, how does the Holy One, speaking of God, pray, blessed be He? How does He pray? Prayer means to bow to the will of God. You mean He went into a, a temple and said, Dear Heavenly Me. The house, since God has a house of prayer, it's not a place He goes to pray, it's a place His people go to pray. How stupid were they? They said all kinds of dumb things. And you cannot believe what they said in the Mishnah. It's dumb stuff. And it's things that Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for when he said it hath been said by them of old time. The word said is a reference to the verbal law of the Halakha. That's what it is. Here's a book. Literature of the Sages. Two volumes. This is the first volume, Oral Torah, Halakha, Mishnah, Tosefta, which means addition. They added things later on, Talmud, external tractates. These things developed, all of this developed into the Mishnah by the time of Christ in about 200 A.D. About 200 A.D., I'll just put it up here. They come up with the Talmud. The Talmud is nothing but trash. It's garbage. And that is what they study. 
This is a great book here. These, this is a part of the compendia. It's got compendia up on top. Compendia was an effort by Jews and Gentile Christians. They came together to put together a study of how that Israel or the Jews and the Christians' history and their culture came together. These were started, they started putting them out in 1964. I've got 11 volumes of it. The first two volumes are about the Jews in the first century. Excellent set of books. They're pretty expensive, maybe 125 or 30 dollars a piece. But I don't know if they're above the 89 or 90 that I gave. Probably that's why I guessed it, 130 or 40. And then you've got this set of books here. I have marked this up to the heavens. This is commentary on the New Testament. You can see how much I've been studying. I always put post-it notes in there, and I mark up everything. If I'm going to study a book, I'm going to mark it as I go. I don't just read something and put it down. I like to go back and review, and I put stars around the parts that I really want to remember. And Mr. Lightfoot, he went through the New Testament, particularly Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he and he's got some things on Corinthians, on Colossians, and other books in here. This is about, I think it's a six-volume set. I only, I've been looking at this one for years. I can't exhaust it because when you read it, you've got to go slow. He'll tell you what the Pharisees said and why Jesus corrected them. I've given you the illustration many times. When Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. They gritted their teeth and just was spitting anger. We'll kill you for that. They said man was created on the sixth day to put him in subjection to the Sabbath. He said the Sabbath was made for man for him to rest, not so he could be put into the rituals and these difficult instruction of a Sabbath day. It's not what it was for. It's for the word Sabbath means rest. So everything Jesus said to the Pharisees, everything was a correction to them. That's why they are just bent out of shape. By the time you get to the 23rd chapter of Matthew, he goes through that whole chapter and says, Woe are you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You compass the land and make one proselyte. A proselyte was somebody that come from another land and they came to Israel to become a, become a convert to Judaism. And they had to be washed, they had to be circumcised, washed in water, and offered two turtle doves. And they became a proselyte of the gate. And they were privileged to partake in the Passover, anything the Jews partook of. And that's another story. And that's the baptism that Jesus was baptized with. He wasn't baptized so he could make sure that he was saved, you know. <laughs> he was baptized to fulfill the righteousness of the Pharisees. He said, let's fulfill all righteousness. They kept calling him a Samaritan because he was raised in Nazareth. And Nazareth to them was a filthy pit hole of the earth. It was like a septic tank. To say Jesus of Nazareth was like to say Jesus of the garbage dump. That's what it was like saying in the first century. They hated Nazareth. It was the land of Zebulon. Right up there in that, that purple thing up there. And they hated that. And so they, the reason Jesus was washed in water so he could, they had to accept him in Israel if he's washed in water. That was there. That's what John said. Therefore, am I come baptizing in water that Christ might be made manifest to Israel. He wasn't giving us an example so we could show an outward sign of an inward work of God. That is so dumb. I've heard every Baptist preacher say that that I ever heard in my life, including my father. Well, I'm done. I'm not done. I wanted to read some things out of this and out of this some things out of this. Don't have time. Maybe I will. 
I hope when I read these things that affects you because it affects me. The preachers in America are doing the same thing the Pharisees were doing. They're giving a verse and just wrenching it and twisting it apart, just like Prosper and Ben Hill, just like calling things that be not as though they were. We're living in the worst times. I believe America is one of the wickedest nations that's ever existed. It has too much money. And the love of money is the root of all evil. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. God, I thank you for letting me see as much as you've allowed me to see. Let me see more. God, I pray that you'll strengthen the flock. I know there's a lot of lonely people because they're having to stay away and stay at home. Let them know that I care about them. I love all of the sheep. I know some of them have a tendency to wander away and wander off. Fight our battles for us. We don't want to fight anybody ever again. I know that everything is your will. And we'll praise you for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Mercy. Well, it's a lot, isn't it? I think it's good if I can document the stuff and read it to you. Nothing like reading it to document it. I'm going to read some more. I don't know. Be good though, like, make a new, Do we want to spend a, the money on it? Well, uh, I can find some free carpet. I can find some free carpet. It wouldn't be. Well, are you hearing from the government? I went to see George and George, and they're putting me on their books to come and uh, make an, uh, an attempt to sue them to get going. But this has all been backlogged so bad from this corona that the, the lawyer that I used up, the one that I'm apparently giving up on, he says that we're uh, six months away. Six months away, away from what? From it. He said before uh, October that they're going to start resetting in person. Right now there's Zoom on meeting people through this uh, internet on, online. What are you so doing there, brother? How are you doing? That's a great one. A great one. You're going to be doing this all week? I'm going to be doing, I'm going to continue on this because I haven't by any means finished this up. Yeah, this is good. It's too like, much. Like textual criticism going through Strong's. Yeah. How to look up stuff. I love well, that. I hope people can learn that you need to look these words up in an interlinear Bible. I just got me. Sometimes they just don't mean what they've translated them into. You start telling people these Greek words and stuff like that, their eyes get big, and they're like, what are you talking about? Whether we like it or not, the, the Bible was written in Greek. Whether we like it, we don't have to like it. They love that English. Yeah, they do like it. English is not a good language. Oh, okay. I'm building a little place to live in down at Tyson. Out on, out on Flat Ridge Road, out past Worsham. Why don't you oh, get your hair cut? I plan on it. I got to because it's just stringy. It I is stringy. I need forever to cut it a few days ago. She says $25. I said, you can't make an exception. She says, that's what I charge, $25. I, $25. I just get it. I'll give one. Can I borrow your hair cutter thing? Uh, I, I'm gonna do like you. I did before. before years before, I came in here with the shaved head. I thought I was gonna look good there. I did for years, didn't I, Jim? For a few years. I guess I don't remember. Oh, good. It's a blur. Yeah, it, it was a, a period I did. I thought it was give me a few sparks in life, like that, like baptism would. You know, like it really. Isn't it amazing what the preachers are doing today? They're doing the same thing the Pharisees are doing. 
Huh? They were just. They didn't know who he was. They don't know what anything is. It's just. Oh, thank you. I love you. Love you too. They don't want to. They don't know. They just don't know. Well, they don't know it, but then the ones that do pick up on things, they're things, they're afraid they won't do. Oh. Let me get my get this back here. Mm-hmm. Well, Victor, when are you gonna? When are you gonna get that? Get with the government people. Well, I was just telling you that I've got one lawyer who says six months out of their backlog. I can't. I mean, let me. Keep, is that good? Can I put that out there for That's you? That's Mike. Mike Jersey, Mike. Mike, Mike Jersey. Give me those. I'll put those out Mike. there for you. You're going to... Here, I'll lift up. Hey, you. what are you doing, guy? Oops, sorry. Pop your trunk thing and I'll put them in for you. 